Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, this is going to be hopefully a more uplifting talk, like John said. Uh, and I'm going to give you some algorithms to go with the models and inference that, uh, that Alex was talking about. Um, so this work is all, uh, or this talk's based on two different papers. Uh, one is on this thing called the holdout randomization test, which is uh, with some collaborators at the Data Science Institute, uh, Victor Veach, who's a postdoc with Dave Bly, and uh, Haran Jung, who's an undergrad that I'm mentoring. And then also this other paper that we have on the archive recently, uh, interpreting black box models with statistical guarantees with a, a very talented undergrad of mine, uh, also Colin Burns, uh, and then a friend of mine, uh, Jesse Thomason. So, okay, so I'm gonna give two motivating examples off the bat. Um, the first one is one that a lot of Broad people probably are familiar with, because it's a paper from the Broad, uh, which is the cancer cell line uh, encyclopedia. Okay, so when I came here in, uh, a few months ago, uh, I talked about, uh, t uh, about um, uh, the GDSC and about doing sort of conditional independence testing GDSC data, because I didn't want to rile anyone at the Broad, but I've gotten over my cowardice, so I'm going to come here and talk about uh, analyzing CCLE data and comparing to what, what was done in the original paper. Um, okay, so, so what happens here? Uh, keeping in mind that I'm not a biologist, so I'm going to make lots of gross oversimplifications, and I don't know what I'm talking about when it comes to biology. Um, okay, great. So what happens here is you want to predict drug response. So you do a bunch of uh, cell line experiments, right, where I'm going to consider one specific drug. I'm going to consider uh, PLX4720, uh, which is a BRAF inhibitor. And uh, you get some covariates, gene expression, gene mutation data, uh, which I'm going to naively call uh, genomic features, right? I'm, there's genomic and transcriptural features, but let's just call them genomic features. Uh, and then you want to build a model to predict this drug response, right? So what you do is you uh, create this elastic net model where you take all of your gene expression data and all of your gene mutation data, and you use it to see if you can predict something like the IC50 uh, on, on this uh, PLX4720. Uh, as a function of, of these, these covariates, right? And then what you want to do is you want to go back and do actual science, right? So this is what, you know, you guys do all day long, is you try to figure out which of these genes are actually somehow, uh, like in Alex's case, causally uh, uh, creating some sort of effect that, uh, that causes the, the cell line to respond to these drugs, or this drug. Um, and the way this was done in the CCLE paper was you, uh, the features were ranked by the coefficient magnitude. Right, which makes, makes intuitive sense, right? The model is somehow fit a good predictor. It's discovered some sort of notion of like what is actually uh, associated with the outcome here. Uh, so intuitively, if you assign a high weight to some feature, then you would expect that that's probably going to be a somehow inf informative or causal or associated feature. Uh, and then there's another example, which is from a paper in Science last year, or two years ago, uh, on olfactory perception. So here they took a bunch of people and they had them smell a bunch of different molecules. Okay, and so they uh, looked at the molecular compound features here, uh, which are just some heuristic uh, decompositions of, these, of, the, of the chemical structure of the different molecules. And then they had uh, humans say, you know, what do they smell like? Uh, in this case, I think I'm looking at what do they smell like in terms of like, do they smell like a bakery or not? Um, and so then they fit a big random forest model to it. And then they looked at the sort of random forest feature selection uh, uh, count heuristics that scikit-learn provides, right? And again, this is another very intuitive thing here. If, if you see that a feature is selected in lots of different random, uh, a lot, lots of different decision trees in your random forest, you would expect that there's some reason that that's happening, so they must be important features, right? And so the idea with this paper is that, uh, you know, when you go and you report these features, uh, you're sort of reporting this heuristic, right? You're reporting this important score. Uh, and a lot of times it makes a lot of sense, right? So BRAF, you would hope, is a very important gene for predicting BRAF inhibitor response. Uh, and in fact, it is. Uh, and similarly, you would hope that things like vanilla are very reminiscent to a human of bakeries, right? Uh, so then the idea is that we're going to develop a method that can actually give you a valid p-value estimate for these features. And it's going to be kind of shocking, right? It's going to be kind of shocking because you still see exactly what you expect, which is that things like BRAF are important. But that once you get past sort of the first top one, usually, maybe the top two or three, it tends to be very, very random what, what actually comes up here. There's not necessarily a strong correlation between what the actual feature importance score that you've given it through your, your heuristic is actually going to be relative to the p-value. Uh, and more so, uh, these sort of feature heuristic scores uh, totally miss a lot of 
uh, things that would have actually significant p-values when correcting for multiple hypotheses. Uh, so in this case, you can go all the way down. I think this whole data set only had something like uh, 800 or so features. And you can go as low as, you know, in the 600s and still find a feature that would have had a very, very low p-value. All right, so these are potential uh, driver genes that you might have actually been missing uh, if you were doing this sort of uh, heuristic, heuristic ranking. And again, I'm not faulting anyone uh, for doing this. It's a totally, totally reasonable way to rank things uh, this way. Um, what we're going to try to do is uh, provide some of the, the tooling, the machinery that Statistic didn't really provide to scientists before uh, when we now move to this like black box modeling world. Okay? Uh, and so, oh, let's see a thing. Okay, so, uh, let's see. Okay. So, we're going to, I'm missing a slide. That's fine. Uh, anyway, so, <laughs> Uh, all right, so we're going to look at two more examples, which is um, even more complicated here. So, so now we're going to look at text predicting movie reviews, uh, where the users either rated them as positive or negative, uh, where they fit a, where the uh, analysis method was to fit a gigantic deep learning model, this BERT model, that's sort of state of the art in text analysis. Uh, and then you want to know uh, which of the words are actually influencing this model to predict whether or not this is a positive or negative view. And then another, uh, another uh, classic example of machine learning now is image classification, right? So the model gets images. It predicts what, uh, whether it's a cat or a dog or an airplane, right? And it does that by fitting a deep learning classifier. In this case, we're talking about inception net. Uh, and then you want to know which of the parts of the image are actually causing the model to make this prediction. Right? And this is a little bit of a twist from the two examples I gave before. Uh, because now we're talking about interpretation instead of feature selection, which is a subtle but different uh, effect where you know, if the model is doing something wrong, meaning that it's using some feature to actually uh, predict Y that isn't associated with Y, we want to know that now, right? So you can imagine that you're a doctor who's uh, looking at uh, using a, a deep learning model to look at some histopathology slide or something, and it's saying, oh, you should give the patient this kind of treatment or something. You would want to know, like, well, what parts of this slide are actually telling you that so that I can sanity check the model? Right? And so even if that's not, not actually associated with it, you want to know because the model is telling you to do something and you want to sanity check that. Right? Uh, and so when we run these kinds of uh, methods that we're going to talk about today, what we get back is very uh, encouraging things that kind of match with what we expect. Um, so you can see here that this is a, the BERT model was uh, trained uh, on this method, uh, uh, on this data, it was state of the art. And yet it predicted this, uh, this review to be positive, even though it was actually a negative review. And it's a negative review because the guy is like raving and ranting about this movie until at the end he says, yeah, right, and totally inverts the entire sentiment, right? He's just being sarcastic. Uh, but what you can see is that like, you know, words that come up are like wonderful, film, uh, bad comes up, but that's not important here because it's overwhelmed by like well and all these other things. Uh, and then the other parts here, this image, uh, you know, this model is predicting, uh, this is a Pekingese, this is the probability from the model, not the p-value for the features. Uh, so this is uh, the model predicting Pekingese, right, and you want to know why is this predicting that this is a picture of Pekingese, and you can, uh, the blue areas here are the parts that our model is uh, considering significant 10% false discovery rate, uh, and so it's showing that it's actually the parts over the Pekingese and not the parts over the, uh, the white dog is. Uh, and similarly, the Impala here, it's this Impala, not that Impala. Over here, the model thinks it's a soccer ball, right? And that's because if you look at the, the soccer ball part, this is important. Uh, and it actually turns out that this person can be important potentially too. Um, and so these are all good things to know. Uh, but I'm going to focus more so on, here, here's the slide out of order, uh, more so on this setup of conditional independence testing. Okay, so these all kind of fall under this same umbrella. So the idea here is we have some data that are observations of experiments where you have features X and response Y. Uh, in the case of interpretation, you know, you can think of the, the response Y here as being the model's output Y. Um, and then what we want to do is we want to sort of understand whether for every single feature J, uh, whether it's actually associated with that Y, right? And we want to do that through a conditional independence test, meaning that under the null hypothesis, uh, the feature J is conditionally independent of Y given every other feature, right? So if I, in the, if I look at like the image case, right, if I were to take this patch and just take it out and then somehow fill it in with a reasonable counterfactual about what I might know about that image given every other pixel, uh, what would the model be predicting in that case? Uh, or in the, the gene case, right, if I, if I remove that gene uh, and then I try to re uh, replace it with a, a sample of that gene expression given the gene expression of every other gene in that genome for that sample, 
what would I expect to see from the output? Okay. Uh, and we want to do this with the challenge of controlling false discovery rates. Okay. So we want to do it so that the user can say, give me back all of the significant results with some like 10% error on average. Uh, but we have this extra wrinkle of we're doing everything through this black box modeling routine, right? So uh, we don't really have access to the model or we don't really have a good notion of what the null distribution should be for that model, right? Even in an elastic net model, the fact that we're using this complicated, complicated regularization, we're using bootstrapping, all these things make it so that the null distribution is totally ill-characterized, right? So all we can do is sort of work with these things as if they're black boxes, all right? Uh, so with that in mind, uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn to... Uh, doing some math, and we can talk about how we do these conditional independence tests. Imagine we have some matrices, x, i, j, where we have n samples and p features. And then we have a response vector. Yeah, OK? I'm going to encourage you to write really big. OK. Those words are going to be hard. And, uh, OK. Yeah. Write even bigger than that. Got it. Should I erase this then? Well, I think everyone knows. Features, response. Um, OK. And so you know, we could imagine that what this is is like genes, and this is like cell lines. Right? And this is something like IC50. Okay, so for the biologists in the room, that might be a, a reasonable way to think about this. Um, yeah, and so, so our goal here is that you know, what we've done is we've learned a predictor, pi theta hat, which takes in x and it predicts out a y hat. Okay? And we want to somehow use this predictor to understand which of these features x, j uh, are actually going to be informative for predicting y. Right? Under the notion that like, this might be a bad predictor, Right? It might be a, an adversarial predictor. It might just be a, like a constant. Right? We, we really just want to uh, sort, sort of provide a tool that lets us use any black box model and then sort of reassures the scientists that uh, if you have a pretty good predictor, it seems like empirically this is going to get you more and more power in our tests. Right? So, so you're encouraged to get a good predictor, but you're not required to have one. So this all comes down to a very interesting observation that uh, Lucas Jansen and uh, Emmanuel Candas and other people had. Uh, which is about these things called conditional randomization tests. Okay, so imagine that what I do, if I want to test, and I'm going to go i here to be samples whenever I use xi, and whenever I use j here, I'm going to talk about features. Okay, so if I imagine sampling xj from a distribution that looks like this, so we'll call this the complete conditional. Okay, so this is the distribution of x uh, of the jth feature given every other feature. The distribution of this gene expression given all the other genes in the, in the genome or in our feature set. Okay. So let's imagine that I sample that. Right? Well, then it's pretty clear to see that the probability of xj um, The probability of xj given x not j and y is equal in distribution to the probability of xj and x not j under our null. Okay, so this is by assumption on the null, uh, which I didn't write up here. So just by assumption, 
this is true. But since we've also constructed this guy, we know that this is equal in distribution to the probability of x tilde j given x naught j, right? Where this part is by construction. So it's a really, really simple observation. But what it tells us is that if I take any test statistic, t, of xj, um, x not j, and y, it should be equal in distribution to that same test statistic on x tilde j, x not j, and y under the null. Say that again? What is the difference between x tilde j and x j? So x j is the real data. Okay. It's what you really observe, right? And then if I knew somehow what the conditional distribution was of that feature given all the other features, right? I could resample that feature and get like a fake feature, right? So, so this is related to like what Lucas Jansen talked about with knockoffs, right? So you could think of it as like a, a single coordinate knockoff. So you have this sort of fake x tilde j. And if, if xj doesn't really help you at all in predicting y, then it's totally, totally a reasonable thing to do to just say, well, then why don't I just look at what the value was of that test statistic, and then sample a bunch of these guys, and look at the value of these test statistics, and see where this test statistic fell in that empirical built-up distribution. Okay. Yeah. So, so that gets us to a p-value, right? Which is, um, yeah, it's right here. Right, so the p-value for feature j is simply going to be originally defined as sampling both of these guys from the null. Let's go with uh, less than or equal. Okay. And then, you know, in a randomization test, what we would do is we would approximate this. So this is like the true p-value. Uh, and then we would approximate this with a randomization test. Uh, by something like the following. The idea is that you've sampled x tilde, uh, k, and y tilde, k, from the null distribution. But from this thing, this uh, sort of clever observation, we know that we can actually just do this conditional randomization test and say that p hat of j Be approximated as some um, test statistic on x tilde just j, x not j, y being less than or equal to t of x j, x not j, and y. Okay. Where now we've, what we've done is we've sampled x tilde j from what I'll just shorthand approximate, at, uh, shorthand write as p of j given not j. Okay. Uh, yeah, so great. So we're at this point where we can just think about if we have these conditional distributions, uh, what we would do. Of course, in practice, we don't have access to those conditional distributions. Um, and in fact, we don't have uh, the ability to run this k to infinity. Uh, in practice, we have to, uh, if you really want to have a valid p value, you'd have to add one to the numerator and the denominator here. 
Um, but just sort of for shorthand, we'll just write 1 over k. Uh, so yeah, so what we're going to talk about today is how to take this idea of CRTs, which they're very powerful, right? Like they've, they've allowed us to not talk at all about our model, where uh, our model can be baked into here, right? So the problem is that uh, what, what would be a good test statistic, right? So a good, a good way to run this test would be the following, right? Uh, you would first, you would look at t. You would calculate your original t uh, using some model. Uh, second, you would, uh, so, so let me actually back this up. First, you would fit your model, beta hat parameters, okay? Then you would calculate t using whatever you want. So you could look at the weights in your coefficient, uh, your coefficient weights in your lasso model. You could look at uh, some like norm of your neural network weights or anything like this, right? Uh, so that could be your t function, right? Uh, and then what you're going to do is you're going to calculate your t hat k times, where what that means you have to refit. Um, I, right, multiple times, k times, right, and then uh, calculate uh, calculate t tilde for that k, right, uh, and then what you're going to do is you're going to look at the percentage of times that t tilde is going to be less than or equal to t here, right. Um, and so this is all being written shorthand, but I think the, the idea should be clear, right? Which is that the idea is, is you fit your model, look at some uh, heuristic that you want, right? Uh, draw some new data for that feature, refit the model, calculate it, compare it, and look at what the percentage of times was there, right? And that gets you back what would be a valid p-value or one-sided p-value. Um, where I'm, I'm assuming here that lower would mean like a better heuristic score. Yeah. So this seems like it's going to be really, really expensive because you're going to yeah. do this for every like, coefficient or every feature and you're doing it k times. Why couldn't you just like refit it once for each feature? Just leave it out. Yeah. So like, leave out x1 and see if your predictions are substantially different. Yeah. So, so when you say leave it out, right, you mean like set the value to zero and run your model? Refit your model with all of the features but one. So you're refitting the model sort of p times instead of p times k many times. Yeah, so, so you could do that, but it's not really clear what the null distribution would be, right? Like, you, get, you would get two different models, right? And then the question would be, how do I know whether or not that the value that I get from, like, my coefficient weight or whatever was significant relative to, you know, like, how do I compare that, right? Um, so one thing you could do, you could look at, like, model error, which is what we're going to talk about today, right? But even then, without... Uh, sort of without uh, knowing what would happen if I somehow could resample from this null world and refit, like you get one model fit, right? And so if the model does okay, if it does around the same amount, if it does, even if it does way better, maybe it's just because like, no, now the matrix is more, uh, is better conditioned and the numerical procedure was easier, right? Like it's not really clear what the like null distribution is by just dropping that feature out. But that is like a classic thing, right? Like if you have a parametric model, you would do like a likelihood ratio test, right? But in a black box case, it's totally unclear how you would do a black box likelihood ratio test. Um, but it is very expensive. So this is the problem. So, uh, so, so the, the main assumptions here are going to be, one, uh, we have access to p of j given not j. Okay, the true conditional distribution, right? So this is this should seem like a red flag to anyone who's saying, you know, I, I'll never have access to p of j. I'll never know what the true gene expression distribution is given this exact value of twenty thousand other genes, right? So there's sort of an assumption two here, which is uh, that it's tractable uh, to refit k times. Uh, times p, right? Uh, and it turns out that the number of k that you have to choose actually scales with p, which you can do through just like a back of the envelope kind of binomial calculation. So, so you actually, uh, if you have 20,000 genes, right, you want to do something like 20,000 k for every single feature, so you have to do something like 20,000 squared refittings of your model, which I'm guessing most people here don't have access to that kind of compute just to do one data set analysis. Cool. So. Uh, and then another assumption would be, 
and that you have like a, a reasonably powerful So you've chosen something that's meaningful, right? That's not just like astrology or something. Yeah. Do you have to assume something also about like the, the fitting procedure? So like the fitting procedure is reasonable or something no. like that? No. So so this is this is what's nice, is that uh, you would hope that if you do a, do get a good fit to your model, that it would somehow be more informative, right? It would have better captured the underlying dependency in the data. Um, and that's what we see empirically, but it's totally guaranteed to control FDR just to have any arbitrary fitting. Well, what if like the model, what if the fitting procedure tries to find a model that's like as bad as possible? Yeah. And then like you don't even, how do you know what the directionality of the bullet three is? Couldn't, couldn't you get the, like the one minus your p-value essentially? Yeah, so, so you can't because what you can get is zero power. Right? So if you think about it, if there's really no condition, uh, if there's really no dependency between j and y, right, between the jth feature and y, right, there's nothing the model can actually learn that'll somehow manipulate your test into thinking that j is important, right? Because there's nothing there, right? As long as you're sampling from this true conditional, right, you're sampling from something that the model can't possibly use to tie to y because it's by construction independent of y. I see, I, I'll maybe follow up after. Sure. So I, I might have missed that, but how you are actually sampling x tilde j? Uh, like, is it? Uh... Right now, it's magic. <laughs> and we're going to talk about it. In practice, you have to fit it, right? You, you get a data set, you have to fit each of these conditionals, right? Um, and then it's going to turn out that like that fit might not actually be good enough. Uh, OK. So the idea here is going to be first that we are going to address this assumption A2. Uh, in a way that still totally preserves our, um, uh, our p-value. And then we're going to sort of uh, compromise and, and, and start talking about fitting empirical conditionals, which will then no longer be in this like mythical, totally valid p-value case, but works very well in practice and has some reasonable theoretical properties. Uh, and then we're going to talk about things that have less clear theoretical properties that uh, really boost power and boost, boost speed even further. Okay. Uh, so, you know, if we think about, I'm going to try drawing a few pictures. Okay, so imagine we have a data set where uh, this is like x1j, this is x2j, and x3j. And this guy is the probability of j given not j. Right? So, Let's say we have three, three samples, and we're interested in the jth feature. And this is like a data set of n, three, n equals 3. And these are the conditional probabilities, the true conditional probabilities, right? So the idea with, with CRTs is that I can sort of randomly, I can, I can take what my original value was here. This is my like true data, right? I can sort of randomly sample something proportionate to all these. I can calculate some test statistic and, and do this procedure, right? Uh, so the problem is that you know we've changed the data set, and so now we have to go back and refit. And um, like we said, it's very expensive. But what if instead what we do is the following, which is what you're probably going to do anyway. Let's call this the training, and let's call this the test, and prime. Okay. So what if instead what we do is we uh, we train on uh, our training data set, and then we only use the testing data set to actually conduct this uh, CRT, and we, we do something else, which is we choose T to be empirical risk, right? So it's our loss, right? Our tests are held out loss. So if you're using squared error, it's mean squared error is your test statistic, right? So at this point, what we say is we'd say T here is going to be uh, the sum from I equals 1 to N prime, L of yi and beta hat train of xi. Okay, and then equivalently t tilde of 
of x tilde i, where x tilde i is equal to x of i and not j, and x tilde of i, j. Okay, so just concatenating that vector together. Okay. So you would still imagine that what you're doing is this CRT procedure, but now the fit just returns the parameters. There's no actual fitting being done here, right? So it's sort of like a, like a dummy fitting procedure, which says, okay, you've changed this, I'll just return you back the same set of parameters that I learned from here, which are still totally independent of, of these guys. Uh, and this will be a totally valid procedure. Okay. Uh, and so that's something that we call the holdout randomization test. So you hold out some data, right? And then you look at how your model performs if I replace that feature with a sample from the null. So it's very similar to just dropping out, right? Uh, but instead of dropping out, we replace it with something that the model uh, definitely can't be using to make a good prediction. Okay. Uh, so that's the HRT. Right. So that's going to be And if we think about it as starting at n and going to n, n plus n prime, um, Right? So all we've done is we've switched from this idea of uh, using the whole data set to a held out data set. Okay. Everything carries forward, but now you can run it on any model, even if the model takes a long time. Yep. So basically you're getting rid of the like, requirement to refit it k time. Exactly. Yeah. So that's, that's going to be our first, our first thing that we're going to cross out. Now, right? So it makes this thing tractable for neural networks, for random forest, things that might take a long time to, to fit. Um, although still not fully uh, as fast as we might want. Because um, you're still going to have to do a lot of samples. Uh, and even if you have, a, uh, have avoided this need to refit, right, you've still got this need to like, run and, and do inference or prediction lots and lots of times. Right? Uh, but we're going we're gonna to fix that too. Uh, OK, so, so let's think about, um, Let's see, which one do I want to talk about first? So there are going to be three, three enhancements we're going to do to this HRT. So this is a totally valid procedure as it is, uh, but now we're going to sort of lose our dignity and make our life a little bit easier. So uh, if instead of thinking of this as a train and test split, um, you know, this is a little bit, it, it's, a, it's a little bit uh, lacking because what we've done is we've sort of thrown away the bulk of our data, right? If you think about what you're going to do, in your normal train test split, it's going to be like 80-20 or 90-10. You're going to throw away the vast majority of your data, and you're going to end up losing a lot of your sort of power to detect any kind of signal that might be in this test data set, right? Um, because you've thrown away, it uh, might be in the data set because you've thrown away everything except the test after training. Uh, so, you know, what you might do instead is that, you know, say that there's no reason that I chose this n prime, and right? I could have just as easily chosen this, uh, uh, sorry, chosen. squeegee thing really punishes mistakes. Okay. All right. So there's, you know, we could have just as easily chosen this to be n prime, right? We could have chosen this as like n prime two. We could have chosen this to be n prime three. Uh, and we could have had different training sets, right? And so what you could imagine is that this actually gets to basically cross-fold validation. Or sorry, cross-validation. Um, where what you would do is you would say, well, 
if I had this as my holdout, I could fit everything else. I could have this as my holdout fit on these two data points. I could have this as my holdout and fit on these two data points, right? Uh, and then what I could do is I could actually hold out a model, or sorry, hold out uh, one data point or one subset of, of data and treat that as the test set for one specific model and fit k models instead of fitting one model, right? Which is still pretty cheap and it's still probably what you're gonna do anyway if you're doing data analysis, right? And then I can actually reuse the entire data set and combine them all into one test. Okay, so, uh, so you can think of that as like a cross-validation HRT. Okay, so that's gonna be, Or right, sorry, it's just in now. Um, equal to sum minus one to n. Okay, where the idea is that this theta hat of i is uh, the model that you would get if you fit on every data, data sample except for the ith one, right? So now you fit maybe n models and leave one out cross-fold validation here. Okay. Uh, so it turns out this, this has massive Im impact on power. Uh, unfortunately, it creates a little bit of a dependence between the null statistics. So, so this is sort of like an approximate CRT, but uh, in practice it, it uh, conserves FDR very well. Uh, and it's also not clear which way the dependence goes. So it might actually make it more conservative. We don't really know. Um, but in practice, the, the dependence is pretty weak. What, yes. what does k enumerate? What, what is k? Uh, so k is the number of trials that you're going to do, right? So the idea was you want to you resample uh, this x tilde and compare this test statistic under the null k times, right? You're going to build up an empirical distribution of what the null, null would look like, right? So you, you have to do this, uh, this k times. So every single time you, you draw a new x tilde, you look at what the model's loss would be if you actually uh, sub in that x tilde, uh, and then you compare it against the original loss. Cool. Okay. Um, yeah, so. That's one way of thinking about this. Another way we can think about this is, um, yeah, maybe, maybe if you'll, you'll indulge me to, to believe again that you know, we still have the true conditionals, I'll push that off to the last point. And we'll just talk one more time about speed. Right? So, so if you still have to do you know, 20,000 genes times 20,000 samples, um, it actually turns out it's maybe even an order of magnitude more than that, so 200,000 times 20,000. Um, you're still probably not going to be able to run this, uh, even if you don't have to refit. But what we notice here is that by this interesting choice of empirical risk, which is just a summation, we can decompose it. Okay? So we could actually look at uh, these distributions, and we could just sort of look at every single point along a finite grid, and we could pre-compute these guys. right? And we could do the same thing here. Right, some grid. And the same thing for this guy. And then what we could do is we could look at what the individual sample loss was for that sample if we were to just look at um, that one data point. So we could think of this as being like loss on Y3 given pi hat of three, tilde of three, okay? So, you know, that's gonna be something that's like this, may or may not be actually correlated with your probability. Um, 
But the point is that every single point here maps to some point on this loss curve. And that really, this expectation is very similar to just doing a big weighted sum. Right? So I could rewrite uh, this whole thing if I, if I call these points, uh, let's say, SI, right? I could rewrite this whole thing as just being a sum uh, of, let's see, how do I want to write this? Sum from i equals 1 to n of the indicator function that, oh, sorry, k. Function that uh, is greater than or equal to uh, SI times, let's say this is like uh, sample here times, yeah, so if we, call, if we call these guys SI, right, we could just write it out as this, where we then sample SI k from this approximate grid pj given not j. Yeah, sure. So, so the idea is, um, let's call this fast. Um, this is like a fast HRT. So what we've done is we've approximated uh, the conditional distribution by a grid, right? And we approximate the loss at each one of those points. Or sorry, we, we cache the loss at every single one of those points. And then we note that our, uh, our actual T statistic is just a summation. So each of these samples can be calculated independently. And then all we have to do is, um, oh, there should be a sum here. All we have to do is randomly sample a point on this grid proportionate to the value that we cached, right? Then look up what its value was for its loss, right? And then add up all of the points for all of those data sets, right? Or all of those samples. And what this is buying us is that instead of having to randomly draw a whole new vector all over again, what we've done is we've effectively, if we, if we think about doing, say, m different grid points here, now we only have to do m times p uh, actual evaluations, times n uh, actual evaluations of our model, which turns out to be tractable. Like, you can use m equals 50 instead of k equals, uh, uh, sorry, there's no, yeah, instead of, instead of, uh, k equals 20,000, right? So you only ever have to evaluate your model 50 times per feature instead of having to evaluate it 20,000 times, for instance, right? And then all, all this comes down to is just randomly drawing balls from an urn, right? Uh, so it's very fast. Uh, in practice, orders of magnitude faster for the same level of precision on your p-value. Okay. All right, so one last thing to talk about is this nasty business of, um, oh, so this guy, this guy was solved by the CV component, uh, is this nasty business of, of uh, estimating these conditionals. So, you know, in practice, uh, you have to estimate these from data. So if I were to go and, let's see if there's a different color marker. If I were to go and fit these models, cool. Right, if I were to go and fit a model uh, for this complete conditional, uh, I might get something that looks sort of like, you know, like this. And then over here, I might get something that's like this. And, you know, over here, maybe I'm pretty good, but still wrong. All right, so where this guy is like, let's call it Q of J given not J. This is an approximation to P of J that we've learned from the data, okay? So this is going to be bad because you're going to put way too much mass in some portions of the space than you should. You're gonna put way too little mass in some portions of the space than you should. And you're gonna, uh, as a result, bias your p-values in general upwards. Yeah? Uh, 
or lower downwards, yeah. So Q, J, given minus J, changes depending on the minus J, right? Is there, is there just one curve, or are there like a lot of curves? There's a lot of curves. There's a curve per data point, okay. right? Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's the J, OK. That's the J, right? Uh, so yeah, so, so this is a problem. And this is like the, the biggest problem that has to be solved whenever thinking about doing these sort of conditional randomization tests. Uh, and so one thing you might want to do then is say, well, what I care about really is the false discovery rate. Uh, and I'm willing to sacrifice a little power in order to control that, uh, at least empirically control it. Uh, and so what I could think about is thinking about, well, if, if I don't have access to this true P, and I really have access to this, then really this integral start, or this uh, expectation starts to look more like an important sampling routine, right? So I'm gonna write over here. Okay, so really what you're doing uh, starts to look something, uh, yeah, like this. where this k here is, um, or sorry, where this w could be, for instance, p of j. J over Q of J given not J X tilde J K K. Okay. And then over here, what you're actually doing is you're drawing these guys um, from Q of J. So, so if I were to do this as an important sampling routine, right, I have a different conditional distribution that I'm drawing my x tilde's from, right? Uh, and so I would want to correct for that by dividing by that likelihood, right? And then I would, want, I would want to multiply back the true conditional weight, right? And this would be clearly just a, uh, all I've done here is just multiplying and dividing, right? I've just canceled those two, those two things out, and I get back the true weight. Okay, but I haven't really helped us at all, because now all I've said is, well, now I just have to multiply by the true weight, which we don't have to begin with. Right? Uh, so instead what we could do is imagine that instead of having the truth, I have some bounds. So imagine that I have some bound. Okay, where for every single value of xj, f is a lower bound to that true probability, and every single value of xj, h is an upper bound to that probability, okay? So that equates to over here, right? You've got something that looks like this, where this would be h, right? This would be h, and like this would be h, and you've got something that looks sort of like this, and we're gonna call that guy f, right? So you want to be able to find some sort of lower bound and some sort of upper bound for this true blue curve, right? Trivially, we can find that, right? I can set f to zero, I can set h to infinity, and that's a, that's a true bound, right? It's a totally useless bound, but it's a real bound. Uh, it's useless because what you'd see is that if we go over here, well, any time that I get any kind of violation, any time I can draw any sample where the model by chance performs better than the, it did under the original data, I'll add infinite weight and this p-value will be gone. Uh, so you really would want something tight. Uh, and so here's an idea. Uh, what you could do is, um, oh, sorry, I haven't described how we're going to use these bounds. Yeah, that's, that's crucial, right? So what the idea would be is that you would want to conservatively weight this, where what you would do is you would say that uh, we're going to give this weight dynamically um, based on the outcome of the test at every single sample. OK, 
Okay, so we do the lower bound if uh, t here is less than t tilde, and uh, the upper bound if t is greater than or equal to t tilde. And so this is why, why this uh, vacuous bound is bad, right? Because uh, the idea is that we want to overestimate uh, the likelihood of an event whenever it gives us something that would raise the p-value, underestimate the likelihood of that event whenever it gives us something that would lower the p-value, okay? So I'm gonna have to give you just yep. four minute now, but in the discussion you can go into more detail. Sure. Uh, well, I mean, the, the short answer is, how do you get these? Well, you can be kind of clever and uh, either use a Bayesian method that gives you credible intervals, or you can use uh, a bootstrapping method, which is what we do in our paper, uh, and you'll get credible intervals over here that say, well, for any given point, I get a bag of estimators in my bootstrap, and I can look at sort of quantiles and see how likely that they think it is. Uh, and it turns out that, the, that as long as you sort of bound these things on average, um, then you don't have to bound them at every point in order for you to get a very conservative estimate of the p-value. Um, in practice, you can just run a bootstrap or run a Bayesian uh, density estimator and pick the fifth and 95th percentile would be the upshot of all of this. Um, yeah, and so, so that sort of adds in this robustness that gets rid of this need to worry about having these true uh, complete conditionals. Uh, they control power, they control the FDR in practice. Uh, they find lots of uh, new discoveries in arbitrary black box models. Uh, and they're tractable to fit on a laptop. So you can run all of this on your laptop if you wanted uh, for reasonably sized data sets. Okay, that's it.